Thank you so much uh, for attending the Cocoon Entrepreneur Sharing Series. Uh, I'm Dino Mon, uh, the co-founder of Cocoon. And for those uh, who are here for the first time, let me just quickly give you a quick introduction of uh, Cocoon. Uh, so basically, Cocoon is Hong Kong's largest co-working space, and uh, it's also a physical entrepreneur meetup center. Here at Cocoon, we have three simple objectives. Help entrepreneurs find co-founders, source or provide freelance work through our Cocoon project board, and, and last but not least, help entrepreneurs find potential investors. So we try to achieve uh, these objectives uh, through uh, hosting and co-hosting many of these entrepreneur-related uh, events, uh, whereby those who are interested in the era of startup can meet up and exchange ideas. And tonight, tonight's event is one of those events. So we're very fortunate to have Professor Monica Lam, Professor of Computer Science, uh, from the department at, uh, at the department of Stanford, at the <laughs> Computer Science Department at Stanford University, and founder and chief scientist of Mocha 5 to share with us her experience on building startups and teaching at Stanford and the current mobile trends in Silicon Valley. So before she begins, I'd like to share a few words regarding her background. So Professor Lam joined uh, the Computer Science Department at Stanford University since 1988. She received her Bachelor of Science from University of um, British Columbia in 1980 and her PhD in Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon in 1987. She is the faculty director of the Stanford Moby Social Computing Laboratory and a co-pi in the uh, Programmable Open Mobile Internet 2020 project, which is an NSF expedition started in 2008. Her current research interests are in building and open and federated social computing infrastructure. She has worked in the areas of compiler optimization, software analysis to improve security, and simplifying computer management with virtualization. So without further ado, let's give Professor Lam a very warm welcome. Thank you, Theodore. Hey, how are you guys? I'm good, we're good. So, hmm, let's see, who do, who do we have here? How many people want to start up a company? Everybody here. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> do you all know what you want to do? How many of you know what you want to build? Okay, all right. And how many of you are in computer science? <laughs> <laughs> Businesses? Business? <coughs> all right. And how many of you watch the game today? <laughs> <laughs> the NFL Super Bowl. <laughs> it was a pretty nasty game, so I have to cheer myself up with an old school T-shirt. <laughs> but those who, of you who didn't, uh, you know, who didn't watch the game, we lost. 49ers lost by just a tiny, tiny little bit. It was really, really heartbreaking. But anyway, um, so what I'm going to do um, is to have a short presentation, and then I just open it up for questions and answers. So I'm going to talk about. I mean, I, have, I, I presume everybody here has heard about, has heard from a lot of startup companies and people from you know, Silicon Valley and so forth. And I'm going to talk a little bit about something that is close to my heart, which is university research and startups. So um, the first thing is that if you really just want to start a company, then I don't actually know how to do that. All right. And the whole point here is that you really want to. You, you have to start with what you know what you want to do, and then you say, okay, it's time you start a company. It is really hard to say, I want to start a company and don't know what it is, because that's not a constructive thing to do, because there's so many things you can do, it's like, where are you going to start? But you really have to be passionate about what you're doing, and then from there, you can go and start a company. And the second bit of advice that I want to give, give to you is that do not do, do, do not do, do not attempt this at home. Don't listen to what I'm saying. The reason here is that I'm not a regular startup person because I actually do research and startups are a side effect. And the kind of things that I'm doing is a little bit too crazy. I mean, it is not for the fake of heart, actually. And I'll tell you why. Um, 
And if you're, a, if you're an academic, one thing I want to tell you is that I'm not a normal researcher either, because I change topics. I worked on architecture, I worked on compilers, I worked on operating systems, and now I'm working on um, social networks. And, um, and there, you know, for those of you who are in computer science, you, how many of you, for those of you who are in computer science, how many of you know what compilers are? Okay. I used, or have taken a course in compilers, how about that? All right. And I've done a lot of work in compilers, and I have switched out on that quite a number of years ago. And people kept asking, I, one, one student came up to me and said, why did you, why did you bail from compilers? He's like, that was a research, you're doing really well in it. What are you doing with all the other topics? And I said, look, what is research? You have to find new problems. I mean, at the beginning of time, there was no, not such a topic as compilers either. Somebody made that up. And we have to keep, keep continuing to make, pro, uh, make problems up. And the whole point here is that, look, I've been at Stanford for 25 years. It is not I have changed, it's the field that has changed. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, there's something actually really wrong. A long time ago, it is about performance, and so you have to work on the hardware, you work on the compilers, but the tide has changed and you have to ride with it. And for me, it's very simple. I only work on, the, I, I try to work on the most important problems of the time, and so I found myself doing different things in the last 25 years. You know, this is the Moore's Law, so things change quite a bit. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about two startups. The first one was started, um, you know, the idea of the project started in 1999. That's, that's a long time ago for a lot of you here. You see, see a lot of young faces here. And uh, the topic I picked was actually not something that academians um, think about. And that is, uh, the topic is actually system administration. Um, it's an interesting topic. I, I, I want to tell you a little bit of the story of how we started this company. It's not about 1999, and um, that was when I was observing how my dad was using the computer for the first time. My niece is here. <laughs> she probably remembers. <laughs> my dad was like, was like 70-some seven, years old before she, he, he started using the computers. And um, a couple of things that happened made me really wonder what we are doing as computer scientists. And the first thing he, what, what we found is that computers break all the time, especially with, the, with, with Windows and PCs. It's like, things just keep breaking. And it's just, you know, he was always wondering, it's like, what did I do wrong? And I have to tell him, it's not you, it's the computer. It's not you, it's the computer. And they kind of, you know, it took, it, it, you know, for most of us, we just kind of got used to it. But when I saw somebody, you know, to, who, who started working on computers for the first time, it was really frustrating. It's like, why on earth is it that you have something that keeps breaking? You know, I mean, most of the consumer products that you like, if they break like this, I mean, they won't, they won't have a business. And then another thing that he said to me here is that he says, you know, computers is really frustrating. When things go wrong, you know, it's like, if my car, if I bang up my car, I just buy a new car. If I bang up my TV, I just buy a new TV. But what's wrong with this computer? When, you, when the computer doesn't work, you can either just buy a new one. Because it doesn't help you. You get a brand new computer, it doesn't have any of your stuff in it. And life is just miserable, you know? It's like, well, I mean, that is a really consumer's perspective of what computers should be. And so we started thinking about this problem and we came up with a new research project. And the idea is that we really need to automate system administration. We have automated, you know, we have automated everything in computer science. Why not system administration? Why do people have to muck with their PCs, worry about upgrades, security holes, and all these vulnerabilities? It just goes on and on and on. So that was really what um, started me working on this problem on system administration. Really not a sexy topic at all. And so what we ended up doing is something very different, and this is the idea behind our first startup called Mocha 5. And the idea is that um, instead of having everybody manage their own little computer, why can't we just manage it by some professional in the cloud? You create a golden image, you put it up in the server, and um, you put up the, you know, you, 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 you have policies for what users can do or cannot do. You push it out through the internet and have it run on whichever computer. And the whole golden image is the entire virtual machine. It's everything from operating system up. Operating system, data, apps, everything. Okay, so if 
the system administrator can, a professional system administrator, can take care of this one image and make sure that it is perfect, that it doesn't have you know, security holes and so forth. Then you just release that, and now you can just run it on everywhere. So what we have done basically is to turn the PC into an app. Okay, so you just download that virtual machine and you just run it on any machine. So that is just a very, it's a very, very simple architecture. It's totally different from what everybody else is doing because everybody was doing patching and, and uh, software upgrades and so forth. And so this is a totally brand new idea uh, that we started playing with in 1999. It's a very simple picture, but the technology is actually very nasty. <laughs> The reason why it's nasty is like, it's exactly the reason why system administration is a really horrible problem, okay? And so now when you have a virtual machine, you can just run it on a Mac, on a Linux machine, or on a Windows machine, it, does this, it just doesn't really matter, okay? So, so you, now you have separated the software state from the hardware state, and <coughs> the, the good news is that if the hardware breaks, you just buy a new one, and it works. Okay, this is exactly what I got from my dad. This is, if it breaks, I should just be able to buy a new one. Now we really can, because all the data, all the state is actually maintained in the cloud. And you just turn it on, and you just download it. Does that make sense? Does everybody here know what virtual machines are now? No. So it's like, whatever state you have, normally it's tied to a piece of hardware, but we just lift it up so that you can now run on top of another operating system. Okay. So, and we use this for the state management. So that's what we did. So we came up with this idea, or we started playing with this idea in 1999. And 2002 is when we came up with this architecture. In 2005, we decided, we, my students decided that they have to start this company because we've been you know, hearing from people that this is a great idea. So we started in 2005. And now it's, um, we just, are, you know, we are seven years. And it is a very interesting journey because the whole point here is it is a very disruptive technology. Why? What we are telling people is to abandon what they have been doing all these years. They have hired all these IT, sh IT people and we are telling them, it's like, do it this way. I went to see um, the folks at uh, Fidelity, you know, Fidelity Investments, and they said, are you, are, you, are you telling me that, you know, I normally I, you know, the company spends about a billion dollars a year on IT, and they have built up all these technologies, and you're telling me that I can just put those things away and use this little, this new approach of system management that a little company with how many people, you know, you know it's like a tiny little company that, have, uh, that you have come up with, and we should just switch out from this huge, you know, like, um, uh, management system into something totally unproven, so totally something new. Are you kidding me? It's like this is what I we found out in 2005 when we first started the company. And what we found that is interesting here is that when we left the, left, the, left the university, we have this concept of a bare metal machine, which means that, which is the most secure version, which is that on this computer, you don't run anything but the virtual machine monitor. All it does is to run the virtual machine. So there is no base operating system that you can um, attack. It is the most secure. This is the only kind of thing that a university can come up with. Okay. And so we came up with this. It's beautiful from an architecture point of view. And we went to see the companies and the, the, the large financial firms and so forth. They said, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, we don't get this. And so it turns out that the idea that we came, we came up with in the university it was a good idea, but there was just no way anybody can adopt this idea. So what do we have to do? Um, we have to figure out the go-to market. Now, how many you, So is there anybody here who doesn't know that term go-to market? Interesting. I didn't know what that term is when I first left Stanford. Actually, um, I talked to John Hennessy and um, the president of of Stanford, and I, I showed him this thing, and he said to me, he's like, what's a go-to-market? I said, like, what is that? <laughs> and the whole point here is that you cannot just release this out on the world and say, okay, just go for this. This is a new way of doing things. We are not proven. Nobody has any clue. Nobody, uh, by the way, our technology is actually pretty far from being usable at the time we left the university. So what did we have to do? So 2005, we started thinking about what is the minimum step that we can 
introduced so that people will use this product. We came up with this idea that, look, you can put your, vir uh, your virtual machine on a USB drive. Well, of course, now it will be on your phone, and in fact, you can do that. And so now you can take the virtual machine on the phone and you plug it in anywhere, you know, onto other people's computers. And so we played with that for a little while. This is the beginning of 2000 and, uh, uh, 2006. And then, and then the next thing we did was like, oh, um, let's not do it the bare metal way. Why don't we have this virtual machine run on your own Windows machine? So this is good if you want to bring your own devices. Have you heard of that term, BYOD? It is now very hot these days. Uh, 2000 and, and um, six, 2007, it's like, well, that was just the beginning. And it's like, look, you may, you know, the company wants to control your environment and you have PCs at home. And it's like, what if you can just let the uh, employees use their home computer, you don't have to buy their computer, but now we have a very secure environment that you can control in the cloud running on their own hardware. So that was the BYOD idea in 2007. And then later on we said, okay, let's introduce um, the next concept, and that is that um, you know, people are getting used to their iPhones, their iPads, and they started saying, I want, I want to use the um, MacBook Air. Okay? The CEO said, I want to run, run, my, run my corporate data, and run my corporate environment on, on, a, on a MacBook Air. And now all of a sudden, what we have been doing is just perfect for that because we're saying that this is a virtual machine. You can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on the Mac. So it solves another problem that became popular a couple of years back. So that's Windows on a PC. And finally, um, last year, um, about, a year, about two years ago, we finally put out the product that is the bare metal, the one that we started with in the university. So this is a very interesting curve, which is that when we are at university, we just went for the, the asymptote in a sense. Okay, so this is the ideal world, this is how we're going to build it. But you have to work on the going market, all right? And so you start from something that is just incremental over what they know, and then you just build your way up. And um, so this is 2000, and we left in 2005, and last year um, we are, Finally, getting on the map in a big way, you know, we're getting, we, and, and so it took us quite a few number of years. Um, a lot of, um, you know, it's not, there are a lot of, um, let's, let's just say that um, there are not that many VCs and, and sponsors that can, that have this appetite to see a company grow for that many years. Um, and so, but this is an interesting curve that I'm going to refer to again from um, to show you the, it is an example of how, how university research meets startup world, entrepreneurship. Um, in a university, I cannot shoot for an incremental startup. Why? Because I don't have the kind of resources nor the reasons to work on things that are, out, that are, that are doable in the, in, in the um, corporate world. All right. There are plenty of people with plenty of resources. They focus on the product and let them. That's what they do. But in universities, we focus on problems that are longer term. And now what happens is that we can shoot for something, we come up with something, but it may take a little while for this to, for, for, for the idea to ease into deployment. Okay. So that's a curve that um, you will see again next. So I have a few thoughts about disruptive technology, and that is that um, you know, everybody told, said that to me when we first started the company. I didn't really appreciate it. It is really hard to change behavior, especially when you're talking about enterprise IT management. I mean, I could not pick a worse topic in that regard. And so if you think about the ideas that we came up with, which was about 2002, is when we came up with this distributed virtual machine execution on users' computers. To this point, it's about 10 years. Um, we, left, we left that in 2005. And this is a long time. There are very, very few companies that can survive a, a development of that long. And so, you know, if you want to play this kind of game, if you want to be really disruptive, you have to be very, very careful. You have to have a long-term research vision that, that works, 
Okay, so here are three things that I kind of noticed. Number one is that you have to bet on the right trend. For virtual machine technology, we are betting on the x86 instruction set. And that is something that has been very well established. And um, yeah, we are using iPads and tablets and so forth. But guess what? Windows for corporations are not going to go away for many years. Because there are lots of business software that runs only on Windows. There's just no way they can move out of that anytime soon. So we bet on the x86. And uh, we bet on the fact that the hardware will get faster because the cost of a virtual machine is just really, you know, it's a, it's a heavy concept. And if the machine's not fast enough, it doesn't work. By Moore's Law, we know it will catch up at some point. And we left just before, just around the time when it was barely feasible. And uh, it is actually also interesting to note that we started the company in 2005. And I think it was end of 2006 or 2007 that Apple switched to the x86 instructions. So that happened after we started the company. And the only reason why we were able to kind of stop the work before even you know, we get a bigger market is because we're betting on the right horse. And that is the x86 instructions side. The second thing is that if you want to play this disruptive technology game, you have to work on a very important problem, a problem that will not go away anytime soon. And it turns out that the concept of, um, of software management and the ability to be independent of hardware are just principles that just, they stuck around. 10 years later, they are still relevant, and that's just, that is very, very important. And the third thing, of course, is that if I'm doing long-term research, you really have to make sure that this is a large market, you know, you are really addressing an important problem. Uh, it's kind of related, but um, the market is very, very important because you want to start a company, there's only one definition of success, is that the company has to make a lot of money. All right? I'm, if you, you like to do research, stay at the university, and I mean, I have that choice, but I will not start a company unless I can make a lot of money because you're working with a lot of people, and for them, making money is the, is the only way to, to be successful. So those are the, so, so we got lucky in a sense that we picked a problem that has all these attributes and we're still in the game because of that. And I can tell you that, you know, it wasn't easy. This, this Mocha 5 was a really hard project. We have to think so hard because there was such a big gap for, the ten, for 10 years between what we want and what people are doing. But I can tell you that it was very, very satisfying when things actually work. You know, we, I think that it is a really good architecture and it is kind of, it is now playing out. And um, in the last couple of years, we, have, we are seeing deployment across the board from the top finance firm to universities and to, to schools. Um, why I say that this is like a, a, a wide range um, in a finance firm, the only thing they care about is security. They don't care about the cost. In a university, they couldn't care less about security. You know, it's like the only thing they care about is the cost. Okay, so this is a solution that actually spans the concerns from an from an um, academic setting to uh, to a, a financial setting. And how big is this market? It's all business. I mean, business software across the board not that runs on Windows PCs. It's a very, very big market. You know, when we know that Windows is a big market. This is actually riding that, and it is like anything they can run on Windows is applicable. So this is a very large. Uh, um, it's a very uh, large market. And um, so, in the last 12 months, we have announced our felt our partnerships with. Um, Dell in America, um, T-Systems, which is the uh, management services for Deutsche Telekom in Europe, and Lenovo in China. So we are finally making it, and uh, we're pretty excited, but I, I can tell you it wasn't an easy project. So are there any questions? I just want to see if you guys want to bring up anything and before I talk about the second project. Can you go into paper? How is the performance of this compared to the native Virtualization works really well because uh, you don't actually do any binary translation. It's only you only have to worry about 
um, the, um, the virtualization of the operating systems. And um, the, I mean, even like you know, four or five years back, Intel changed the architecture, so it is very easy to virtualize. Um, now that you have multiple cores, even on phones, you know, so all these adds up to making like virtualization just really easy. The only question, the only thing you do have to worry about is um, 3D graphics, and that's a we are waiting for the for the graphics uh, chips to be virtualizable. You know, for the graphics to be virtualizable, but in the business setting, it's not a problem. I mean, you can watch videos and then you can do you know easy things. You you really do not want to play these. <coughs> fast um, shoot em up video games, okay? Now that's not what it is for, because you will lose, okay? <laughs> you play it on top of virtual, on, on virtualization. But in general, it's just not a problem. Right? Maybe I'll take three questions, and I want to go on to the next part. Yes. Sounds like uh, it took you some time to um, do research before you really sold the product. We're up to seven years, right? So um, how did you sustain financially through all these years, right? You know, since 2005, and before you really make some profit or money out of it, and how did you, how did you attract talent to keep them stay with you, within your company? Make, make the people more stable, your teams, to keep it going after all seven years? I mean, it's a pretty long time. It's a pretty long time. The only way it can work is that it's a really large market. You have to have VCs that understand this and they're going, you know, they're going for the big deal, right? And how do you attract talent? The prop, the architecture is attractive. And um, and in some ways, uh, we, our engineers are just incredible. Um, and um, they just, I, they, they believe in the vision. Right. They are not so, you know, they understand why this is the right solution and they're going after it. Of course, we are making progress along the way. We have developed many, many different, um, uh, different kinds of technologies all this, all this time. We didn't just sit there and wait. And what we, are, um, what we are selling right now really is accumulation of all these years of effort. And um, so what we are putting together is a team that believes in the vision, and that's how we do it. And by the way, it's very funny you think the seven years is a long time, right? I mean, it really depends on what is the problem that you're solving and, and what you need. I mean, I mean if you, even if you take Google, it took them like 10 years before the IPO. So, of course, they have a, you know, a science of success from a year off. But, um, and, and, but, but you know, like as I mentioned, I mean, this is not for the fate of hearts. Know nothing about computer science. Can you say what compilers are? Compilers? <laughs> oh, it is the one piece of software that the short answer? It's a one piece of the software that translates between the humans and the hardware. Because the hardware says understands zeros and ones, and we understand English words, so that's what a compiler does. I have a question for you. So, how far do you think you've come along in actually solving the problem that you defined in the beginning? Where you said that uh, the computer is not easy to use when you explain that to your dad. Uh, well, you know, for example, you know, computers even today, you still have to run like a virus software on, on the desktop and continually update it, get software updates from the uh, software um, operating system provider and so on. Um, how far do you think you've solved this problem with uh, Netlify? We solved the problem for the enterprises, and that is that a single IT staff member can manage unbounded number of, of, of desks. The, what we found is like uh, change is continuous. It is not like we have eliminated the need to make the updates. What we have done is to say, have a single expert make the update and have the updates be reflected on as many people as you need it to be. So we just make it scale, and um, so that's how the price goes down, and then the security goes up as a combination. And so what is interesting about this particular product, unlike all the other products, is that we are extremely friendly to the end users because um, the 
virtual machine runs on your own computer, you can still get a very high, uh, it is still very interactive, uh, give you a good response time as opposed to uh, what companies are doing, uh, what some other solutions um, are where you have to remotely log in, log in to some machines in, you know, in the data center and every single keystroke that you type goes up and down and if you happen to be across the ocean, well, it'll take a little while. So, so the combination that you have uh, responsiveness on the end user's devices and central management by the IT is why that solution is unique and um, it's, it scales. Good questions? All right, we'll take one more and then we have to move on to the second topic. Actually, do you think that the, um, the media focus on uh, cloud computing and uh, maybe marketing from VMware, all those things, help you smooth out your curve? Oh my goodness, that's a wonderful question. Um, VM, VMware is extremely helpful for making this happen because VMware is very, very famous and they have made a lot of IT professionals very successful by, by, in, by introducing virtualization to the server space. The only problem here is that um, VMware, where, VMware is uh, pushing servers and so when they say we're doing desktop virtualization for management, they are still putting the virtual machines in the servers. And so it drives up the cost like there is no tomorrow. Right? And, but because they are VMware, they've got a lot of um, companies educated about the use of virtualization. And so what happened is that in about 2000 and maybe 7, 2006, 2007, they, there was just a lot of publicity on desktop virtualization. All the large companies signed up with, virtual, with VMware. And so they got educated, but it, it took them a few years before they realized that it was a very bad solution for the, because of the combination that it costs a lot and the end user's experience is horrible. And, and because of that, they all learn about desktop virtualization and when we come to them and say, look, this is how you're supposed to do desktop virtualization, but th it works. But it took them that many years. This is part of the reason why it, is seven, it took us seven years. You really have to, have to look at the timing of these projects. And if, if VMware doesn't exist, I don't think it will take off. And, uh, but VMware picks the wrong approach. And by the way, um, well, you seem to know this topic, and you might find this very interesting to note that in, 19, in, 2000, let's see, in 2000, I made a proposal, proposal to NSF, and the original proposal is exactly VMware's uh, solution, the BDI solution. But by 2002, we figured out that that was a really bad idea. Okay, so I don't know why it took them so long. So, so by the time we started the company, we are doing only the client-based solution and they are pushing the server solution. And this is, this is a very important reason why uh, we actually even succeed to the level we do today. Because we just don't have the muscle to, let people, to tell people about this new, totally new approach. Very good question. So I, I, I would like to move on and then we can pick up more questions at the end because I think it is the next question, the next problem is next, top, next project is even more interesting and you will have even more questions. So, so we started, so I took a leave of absence in 2005 and I returned to Stanford in 2007. And I looked around and I saw that there is a huge problem looming. And, um, and that is what, hap what is happening with social networks. <coughs> so at that time, um, it was still Google and Facebook duking it out. But of course, we all now know that Facebook won. And what, they, what was introduced is the concept of proprietary social networks. And that is that you guys want to share, give the data to me, I will share it for you. As a computer scientist, this is the stupidest architecture, you know, it's this very simple centralized scheme. And I would never have guessed that this is where we are today. Okay, I mean it is just such a such a naive solution, but that's what works. Right? There's a lot of money in it, so Facebook grew and grew and grew. So 
So what we have is, uh, is when we started looking at this problem, we are very, very concerned about the privacy issue, which is that a lot of people put the data up, they have to sign away the rights, and, fa and for example, Facebook own the data, and they, you know, they can sell it, they can change their rights on, or change the privacy settings and so forth. And by the way, it's not just Facebook, Google Plus, and, and all the other ones are the same. They are all proprietary social networks. So that's one thing. Well, what happened next is that Facebook introduced the proprietary app platform. And what it means is now that if you want to write apps that uh, involve your friends, the best thing to do is to write it on top of Facebook. And now they have a lot of power. All right, so for example, um, Zynga took advantage of this and they grew quite a bit. And, um, but once they got somewhere, Facebook turned around and said, oh, by the way, you have to pay up. 30% of your revenues. What is 30% of your revenues meaning? It turns out that for that quarter, it was, it was reported. I mean, I, I, I don't know for sure, but it was reported in the newspaper. That was 90% of the profits, okay? And what we started worrying about is the concept of a monopoly, all right? If they own a billion users, they, users data, they said, if you have to build social apps, you have to build it on my platform. And today they charge you 30%. What if they come and say they want to charge you 50% next? Revenues, by the way. Right. So, so that is alarming. And the third thing that is even more scary is what's happening right now is that they are about to move into messaging. Okay? You know about WhatsApp, for example. WhatsApp is an over-the-top service and you have a relationship with uh, WhatsApp and you, know, you abide by their, their rules of engagement in a sense. And um, Facebook has just recently announced that they are changing the app so that it can be used by anybody. It's not just the Facebook users. And it was reported that, um, that the uh, telcos have lost like billions and billions of dollars in SMS messaging in the last couple of years because they're losing to these uh, over-the-top services. The interesting thing there is that um, telcos are very different from Facebook, right? Facebook is a free service and everybody says, look, they provide you a free service and they ask you for your data. If you don't want to, just don't join, right? I mean, so it's free, so okay, we take your data. What I'm a little bit mad at is that when I have a phone, I have data I want to share with you. I, I should be able to share it with you, right? And I pay the telcos about $100 US a month to get the data from. Don't tell me that this is free, right? I put up my money, about $100 a month, and I don't have a convenient way to share pictures with you. But now I have to go through a third party, such as Facebook, and give up the data to them. It's like, what's wrong with this picture? Okay. So there is something terribly wrong, and I think the technologists have a lot to blame for it because what we have is a very, 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 very naive centralized model. So this is 2008, so we made a proposal to NSF. We got a big grant to try to solve this problem, and guess what happens? So we started working on this, and we tried to make up an open social network. We tried and tried, and we, we, we saw that it doesn't work. And I say, okay, let's work on an easier problem. How about the app platform? We tried an open app platform, and we came up with different ideas. And so, in the end, I shut down three projects, by the way. We built it, and we found out what's wrong with it. We tried another time, and the third time, and tried it three times. And we finally came up with something that actually we think that might work. This is the fourth attempt. And it turns out that what we, we basically retreated. Okay, we started with trying to open the social network, because I can't do that. App platform, we can't do that. And we retreated to messaging, was that we have a shot at creating an open messaging platform. And the strategy here is that if I can hold on to messaging, which is very, very, this is a very touchy time right now, because today, most people are still using SMS and maybe you know, augmenting it with some services. But in the end, if Facebook takes over, or Google takes over, and everybody is doing the proprietary messaging, then they have control over that. So, you know, we have some conversations with the operators, and I said, look, 
you have to make sure that you don't lose the messaging. Why are they losing messaging? It's because they're no longer fun, and they charge way too much, right? So we, what we say is that you, you hold on to the messaging, then you have a chance to go and take the mess, make the messaging the base on which you build the app platform, and then you, on top of that, you build the open social network. So we have come a full circle of, of what, you know, we tried to solve the biggest problem, we couldn't. And now we have a, actually a solution that goes the other direction. And this is all um, made possible because of the mobile phone. Right? It's really hard to disrupt behavior, right? This is what I was talking to you about. But when you have a new mobile device, when you have a new device, the computer, the mobile phone is really the next computer revolution, right? I mean, they went from mainframes to workstations, PCs, and then everybody was sending stuff in the cloud, and now the mobile is going to change. It introduces a new change. You have to take advantage of it, and you, st you, you have to start with the messaging. The phone is a very, is your personal little server that is on 7 by 24. There is no reason why you cannot turn them into really powerful devices. And with this, we're going to go and kind of have this open revolution starting from messaging all the way to social networks. So what are we talking about here? Let me explain this with a very simple picture. I, I suppose everybody knows that picture. How many people here are on Facebook? OK. How many of you are friends with each other? <laughs> OK, this is a pretty close group. But the whole point here is like Stanford, pretty much, I would say 99% of the people are on Facebook. Are on Facebook. Guess what? They are not my Facebook friends. But I have access to 10,000 students' email addresses because I belong to a different network. It's called the, social, it's called the Stanford Network. Okay. So yeah, they may have a lot of users, but it doesn't mean that this is going to take over. But today, that is the way things are built. You have these little, you have these powerful devices, and they are all attached to these social networks like they are dummies. Okay, I'm just a little client, and you just give me web pages so that I can view things. And now you have a Facebook as one example, LinkedIn as another. These are all silos of relationships that they create, and they have their rules of engagement. All right. So as I said, look, even though all the Stanford students are on Facebook, we are not friends, and as a matter of fact, teachers are, are advised not to friend their students for an obvious reason. But of course, I do social things with them. I go to um, conferences with them. I need to interact with them. We have educational software that we may want to run with, uh, want to use to, with each other. Why on earth do we all have to behave according to the Facebook rules? Okay. So at the beginning, we started this project worrying about privacy. And then we started realizing that lots of kids, I, I know a lot of them, they don't care about privacy. Okay. And then we said, OK, we care about monopoly. And we do worry about monopoly. There's only one company that enjoys being, that, that likes, likes monopolies, and that's the company that, is, that has the monopoly. And now the third thing we are realizing is that you really don't need to have these rigid rules of social engagement. All right. I should be able to say, here, everybody here, here are my slides. Would you like to see the slides? I should be able to just give the slides to you, as long as you have a smartphone with you, right here and on the spot. What is this whole thing about uploading it to the cloud and, 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 and posting that and telling you guys to go to download and so forth? Why do we have to do this? So, so but that, anyway, that's the, that's the architecture today. And this is what we're doing today. Uh, this is a, it is kind of flipping the social network inside out. So the concept here is that we have these phones. I should be able to message you on your phone based on your identity, not your TCP IP address. So I have no clue what my TCP IP address is. How do I know yours? I mean, this is insane. All right. So what we have done is to build a social network system that is based on messaging. And the messaging is using everybody's identities. As long as I know your identity, your, your phone knows your identity, we should be able to message each other through this, net, through this system. The system is doing nothing but messaging. No rules about friends of friends and, 
and so forth. And what does this, what does the messaging do? Is it you say I need to send this message to the so and so and this and there is a little bit of a cloud service out there. It holds the data temporarily for the reason that sometimes your phone is not connected. It holds it when your phone gets connected. You say you know this is who I am. You have a proven identity. You get the messages and the cloud service gets rid of that message. Okay. So it is nothing but a temporary mess, you know, buffering for messaging. With this system, you don't have to build the gazillion data centers that Facebook is building. You don't have the cost of that kind of infrastructure. Now you don't have to in evade people's privacy as much as Facebook does. And this is taking full advantage of what the phone can do. So the concept here is that you know, which, who, who, what are the people in a social network? It's very flexible. I, could, I should be able to create a social network here, right, on the spot. All right? I can be, go to my class and say, like we're a social network here. We're exchanging pictures with the people here. Or I can add my family to it, and I can have a social network. And, it's like, and then here is my family members in Hong Kong. It's another network. You can just create all these things as long as you know their identity. It's no different from you writing a piece of email and you put people's, it's like a mailing list. How many mailing lists do you have? Gazillion, and there should be that many social networks that you get, you're, you're attached to. So that's the architecture. Now the interesting thing you might ask is that, what are you doing with these phones? I mean, you know, surely you're not telling me that all the data will just only reside on the phone. Of course you're gonna lose the phone, you have to upgrade the phone. But what do you do with your photo galleries today? You took a lot of pictures. Where do you, where, what happens to the pictures on your photo gallery? You back it up. I mean, it could be iTunes. You just put it up on your, uh, your, your PC. It could be iCloud. It could be Dropbox. Um, if you want to put all the pictures up on Facebook, you can do so too. So what we're going to do with the social network is allow anybody, allow all the users to pick their backups. Okay. I can put mine in Dropbox, you can put it in your Facebook. When I send you a picture, through the messaging service, you will see a little thumbnail. It doesn't cost that much, you get a thumbnail. And if you press the button on that picture, then the high def version will show up on your phone. Where does it come from? It's wherever you want to host it, okay? And now we have opened it up, because we are just letting anybody choose the storage that they want, and now we have opened up the social network. Does that make sense? The most important thing is that it has a uniform user interface. I click on it, I just don't know where it is. I click on it, it just is fetched from wherever it happens to be. And this is how we open up the network. And we also say we open up the app platform, and the reason is that with the messaging system, it is not just end users messaging each other, we expose the API to apps so that the apps can now send messages to the other, uh, to apps on other machines. Give you an example. The picture there is a is three people playing a Scrabble game. How do we how do we build a Scrabble game today? You have a Scrabble game server, so that all these little groups of three, four people, two to four people can play Scrabble off the server, and then you would just be a little client attached to the server. And guess what? What happens to the server? It's like if I have to make sure that it can handle a lot of people playing games simultaneously, I have to make that server scalable. I have kids telling me, it's like, I have a game, it's going, but I cannot afford the <coughs> server piece. All right, I don't want to, I don't know if I, I will make it or not. It's like, now why on earth do I need a server? I'm just playing a little Scrabble game between three phones. If I want to play the word, hello, then I would just say, here is a message with that phone. Hello, why don't you put the word hello in, in space X, Y, Z. So now, what we have made possible is an API so that on the phone, you can just say, oh, I'm sending messages to these two people I'm playing games with, and there is no need for any server. This is the only Scrabble game I know that has that property. We are just leveraging the messaging service that I have built anyway for, for users to talk to each other, and now apps can run as peers on all the phones at the same time. Uh, uh, just, just like messaging, and now you can build it up from there on. Of course, you can still have server-applied code; it doesn't stop you from doing that, but you don't need to. 
So we just built, we built a Scrabble game like this, and it has to be the best Scrabble game out there. You know why? Because it's free, and it is ad-free. It's like, how do you afford that? And he's because my student just donated a few weeks of his time. He just put it out. It's open source. You can just put, download and run it on your software, on your phone. He has no server cost. It's like, why not? So why don't we have something like this? And of course, it doesn't stop him from putting ads into his software. And every dollar he gets from the ad goes to his pocket. He doesn't have to pay for the server fee. Why? Because there is this messaging core that is already provided. So that's the basic idea. It is an inside-out uh, social network. It's totally different from what we see today. And I, and I truly believe that this is the only way we can take full advantage of the billions of phones out there. Okay. Don't tell me that now that everybody has these smartphones, you can take videos of, of cats and dogs and whatever, and you just want to send it to a couple of friends. The only way you, you can do this is to put it up on YouTube. That is really silly. Billions of phones, you have a huge network, you have to do distributed execution. And what we have done is to provide an API so that you can just quickly write these social games as easily as, if, I mean, easier than doing server code. Um, last summer, I have seven high school students, and they wrote five um, multi party games in six weeks. Starting from scratch, they don't even know what HTML5 was. We just taught them, and they wrote a little game that's, that's you know that they like. Right. So that's the whole idea: is that if we do this right, it will completely open it up. There will be many, many apps for everything from education to health to business to all the you know. There's so many multi-party apps. Every single app on your phone should be multi-party. Should be a social app. When I I play with a little drawing program. I want to see my friends' drawings. I don't want to just draw by myself. All right. So the whole concept here is that we, if we do it right, everything on the phone should be social, and they are not tied to a proprietary social network. Um, so that's the basic idea. And you know the hardest thing? You know what the hardest thing is? Go to market. <laughs> yes. The problem I see with that is that. Something like Facebook, that's where the money is. I mean, if you're a big advertiser, for sure this peer-to-peer -peer is going to be very, very attractive. But uh, the thing about Facebook is if I have access to that database, I have access to all that information, I have access to all that those people, and that's a sort that's a lot of commerciality. There's a lot of money there. So the money's going to be drawn to Facebook. Facebook is going to sub up all the money from people who want to advertise, communicate, uh, and when they have that kind of financial power, they're going to be able to accomplish tremendous things that would be very difficult for you to do on a peer to peer basis. That's where the money's going to be. Do you, In Facebook, do you remember AOL? Sure. Was AOL huge? It was. It was. And guess what happened to AOL? What? It cannot I'm help I'm not sure AOL is necessarily parallel to this. It is. Situation. The reason is that AOL is a proprietary closed system, and there is just no way AOL can compete with everybody participating in an open way. Okay? Uh, I may not, you know, the company, you know, what we, we, we have a company, we started a company that provides the messaging layer, the API, and so forth. We will never be making the kind of money that Facebook is, and I don't think anybody needs to make that kind of money necessarily if there is an alternative that is better for everybody. Okay. So there are many, many billions of dollars, of, sorry, there are many companies out there that makes billions of dollars who, what, what, who would not like to see the power that Facebook has. If you have an architecture that allows all the other people to play, I don't know, I mean, what is the steady state at the end, right? Because I think this is just the beginning of social. And by the way, Facebook is the web style of social. Right? It hasn't really fully, em fully embraced what mobile can do. I mean, there's just no, I, I certainly believe that the pendulum is swinging. Okay? We went from the mainframe to PCs to the cloud. Why? Because the PCs are too big. I want availability. I need to be able to get my data anywhere. I have to go through the cloud. 
But guess what? With the phone, this is more available to me than the cloud. Why? On the, on the plane, I still have you know, 100 gigabytes of information right there at my fingertip. You know, yeah, I, I mean, eventually I may be able to download it if I have a network access. So the, the false is a new, is a, is a, is, this is a new revolution. I kept telling all my students, there is no better time to do research than now. Okay, there was another time which was about 25 years ago when the PCs first got introduced and it became quickly ossified, unfortunately. <laughs> But this is the biggest round, is the phones. Billions of phones, everybody has a phone. There's no other round after this. And of course, this is my viewpoint, it was, it's going to be distributed. And I want to be there first, okay? And um, I also, well, maybe it's just not fair, but I also heard that if you're doing good work, you would have, at least half of the audience would be disagreeing with you. So, <laughs> so maybe maybe it's okay <laughs> that some of you disagree. <laughs> anyway, the hardest problem is go to market. All right, same problem again. What are we gonna do? And the end users do not care about privacy. The kids, they don't care about privacy. They don't care about monopoly. They don't care about open systems. Uh, rules of engagement. Now that's coming interesting. I don't know how many kids are telling me I hate Facebook today. I hate Facebook. Why? Because all these things, it just, it's a whole system of trying to monetize your data. They push you into sharing data in many different ways. That's where the, that's what we have to, have to do is to give the end users a better user experience than what they are doing on Facebook. Okay? And so what are we gonna do is to say, we have to give user the value proposition. And I just want to give you a basic idea of what we, we have come up with, and that is that in the UI that we have, it is people focused. The minute I form a group, I can do gazillion things with them. You know, I can run a whole bunch of different apps with zero friction. Right? If I want to play a little struggle game, I don't need to sign up to Game Center and find your fake name and then look you up and stuff like that. We just create a little group, and with that, I can go and run any of these apps. I will social, be socializing with you. And what we found here is that you know, we, the, 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 the UI that we spend a lot of time on because of the go-to-market makes it possible to play with your friends with very, very little overhead. Today, everything is too clunky. You have seen no nothing yet if you think that this is, that Facebook gives people a good experience. And the only way for us to get out of this is to lead by innovations at the user experience and nothing to do with the open system, by the way. Okay, so maybe that was the part, part of the reason why I think we have a prayer. And we, we have come up with this, what we are going after is that we change the experience and reduce the friction so much that people can use their computers to chill with their friends. Okay, right now, it's like, okay, if I have to communicate with you, I will do that on the phone because it is too clunky and so uh, A lot of kids are playing solitary games whenever they have some downtime, you know, and say, oh, I don't want to work right now. Pull out a game and play some games on their phones. They are spending time. But what we're going to do is to make it so easy that when you want to spend some time on your phone, you spend it with your friends because we've done social right. So that's the idea behind it. Um, and if we do it right, the time you spend you playing with your friends is going to be off the chart in terms of retention and in terms of frequency of use. And um, I'm going to show you this picture again. So what we're going after is really a social OS. You know what a, um, you know, have you heard people talk about how the browser is the new OS? Right? Because the browser is on every single platform and you just write web pages and it just runs on all those platforms. And what we are trying to go, we are going after is that this is a new social OS. It's going to go across the platform and you write the code, write a little API and now it just, it, it just uses all your friends on your phone. It's the phone, um, your phone contact list, which is just about the biggest, it's the biggest network in a sense because you import all the different networks into your phone. And 
So, and then when you want to write a social game or social interaction, it's as easy as writing a web page, okay? And when that happens, what it means by social is very, very different. It will be very, everything will be very social. How many people know about Dropbox? I have, okay, um, very good. <laughs> Dropbox, has the, I cannot believe this is what we have on Dropbox, you know, that people are using Dropbox on their phones. The concept of sharing folders with people that you, you know, that you share, you know, it's like I, I need your name on, 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 your, on your, you know, your, your Dropbox account and I have to make this folder and now this folder is available to you. It's like, seriously? I mean, this is not how we're going to do it. And so what we're talking about here, the, the upper right corner is that we're going to create a social OS where everything is smooth, simple, easy. But it's going to take us a little while to get there, just like the bare metal version of uh, virtualization. What we're going to introduce first is a little group chat. You download this code, you will ask, it's like, what's new? It's like, nothing new. <laughs> it's our baby step. Okay. When I build a messaging core, I have to build a little group chat around it. And then the next thing is that we're going to start building apps and we're going to start building the API out and then you will bring in the users, you bring in the partners, and until then you won't see the, the big difference. But there will, be, there will be this path eventually, hopefully it will take us to social OS, and hopefully this time things will go a lot faster. Siri talking to us. So anyway, so that's the basic idea. Um, our group started the company in, two thousand, in the in fall this last year. This is just uh, September uh, 2012. Again, my, you know, my students made me. So I'm taking a leave of absence and I'm working at this company called Movie Social Inc. Um, and we actually have a bit of, we, we have uh, actually released the software. It's a very soft launch. If you want to, you can download it. It is called 2 Plus. It is available on your iPhone. How many people have an iPhone? All right. Um, I have created a group. If you download the software, you can join my group right, right away, and we can exchange information, and we can go on from there. Um, we are contemplating. We have not firmed it up yet, but we are going to create a closed beta, and I um, would love to invite you guys to participate in that. You either download it, um, download this and, oh, it's called Cocoon, so it's pretty obvious. When you download it, there is an invitation to join this Cocoon group. You click on it, we are now talking just like what we said earlier. It should be totally friction-free. Everybody here should be in the network with, you know, just, just with two clicks. And if you don't have an iPhone with you, or don't have an iPhone, you can write to me to, at uh, lamb at mobisocial.us. We will add you to the list. And um, i love to invite you guys to the, this, this closed beta. Because what we're doing is not just a single app. It is an app platform. It will make it very easy for you to build uh, social apps. So for example, how many people have heard of Pulse? So Pulse is a news reader, and we have integrated Pulse with our social app platform on the on a prototype we have at Stanford. It took them about half an afternoon to make their app social. Um, and the way we have made it is it's it's a very nice design in a sense that when you exchange um, stories with your friends, we take over. We just share with your friends, and um, Pulse actually never gets they don't get a single bit of the social data. So we just completely draw the line. They, it's very easy integration. They have social functions, but the end users do not have to give up any of their friends' private information to post just so that they can use the social function. And we want to be able to build that kind of apps through and through and just make, and that is, I believe, the clean way of building social on the mobile. All right, so do you have any questions? Yes. How do you know the model? What's the business model? What's the business model for it? What's the, what's the business model for it? How do you charge money in the future? Or you sell it to Tyco? How do you make it work? Let's just put it this way. I have your attention. If you 
users are going to use this app as much as our group is using it today, we will be fine. Now leave it open. It is an app platform. There's a lot of money in an app platform. Do you know, for example, um, do you know how much money Mozilla makes? Mozilla makes the Firefox browser. It is even an open source browser. How much money do they make a year? $300 million. And it doesn't come from any of the end users. And they do not take users' data. So I really want to get this idea out here. That is that you don't have to. You, know, you don't have to steal users' data necessarily to make money. There are alternatives. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that we won't take users' data. <laughs> we might have to do that. But the whole point is that it is not the only way. I mean, I don't believe that given what we're doing, we will never, even the, the wildest dream, I mean, wildest success, we won't be as rich as Facebook, and we don't need to, because I think it was unnatural. Okay, it was an unnatural system. I don't think it will last forever. I don't think it, I think it is, this is the kind of thing that you have at the beginning of social, just like AOL is the beginning of internet. There is just no way that is going to be the end state that we will have. Yeah? Uh, in, in your system, how do the end users control their costs? But what if a uh, billion people join your mailing list and your backup stores, S3 account, and all of a sudden there's a billion downloads? Hold on a second. Um, if I have a million users, that's yeah, a good yeah, problem. Yeah. I don't have a problem. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to have AWS and it scales arbitrarily. Right, we so have you have a you're really big bill because all of a sudden you have a million downloads. Yeah. I will make a lot of money. Yes, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> if I have millions of downloads, there. The, the important thing to note is that technology is cheap. If I have the eyeballs, if I have all these people downloading, I have many ways of, of leveraging it. Just give you a little example. Um, so this is a chat program to start. If you download it, you would say, oh, maybe it is a prettier looking thing than uh, WhatsApp and has a little bit more functions. All right. If I want to, I just put a little <coughs> ad in it, and I will make some money. You know, there is all there are, there are many many different ways. I don't want to go into all this today. Um, as long as I have your eyeballs, and I will be able to um, to monetize it. Okay. And by the way, given that it is an app platform, as I mentioned, the Pulse Reader, they provide we pro we let them we, they we so they have a social Pulse. They did not have to put up any servers. They are using ours, and I am sure that they would be willing to share a little bit in terms of because we are providing also infrastructure, API, and so forth. There are just a lot of upsell opportunities and so forth. It just goes on and on. I'm not worried. Shall we take two last questions? Sure. There's one at you. Oh, was that a hand up over there? So wait, let's take three. So, well, anyways, first of all, I'd like to uh, commend you on doing the right thing. Um, if I can read my co-founder's mind, I can. I think he's going to develop our Apple and you guys. Yes, please. <laughs> that is the most important thing so is to get um, to app question. developers. Yeah, we're, we feel the same way about like openness and we want to do the right thing. Uh, we're doing something for early childhood education. So or what kind of education? Early childhood education. Oh. So early. that's a concern. But I want to get back to you. What's your, what's that? You know, go to market. Go to market? It was hard to find that. While you were talking about 2 Plus, when you didn't show the, I was at Google 2 Plus, didn't come up. We have not gone to market. Okay. Um, we are, we are kind of, this is kind of like a soft, if, let's put it this way, we're debugging. We're debugging. <laughs> we're just telling friends. So we find out what's wrong with it. I can tell you all kinds of things wrong with it, and I'm, we're already making the changes. So right now, you know, it is. Um, um, we are not worried. Um, have you guys seen the book The Lean Startup? I think it is a really good, really good, uh, just yeah, really good book. 
Yeah, <laughs> I see. So the way we look at it is we just have to make sure that it is viral, and then we worry about scaling. All right. And I already know so many problems with it today. And, um, and um, you, right now we are not releasing our sort of well, go-to-market plan. Um, we, have, we have a bunch of ideas. And we will be doing a lot of experiments. We don't know for sure which one really takes off, but we have a lot of ideas. Part of, all, part of the reason also is that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who would like to see this succeed. We have a lot of goodwill and a lot of potentially powerful partners because of the architecture. So again, I, I believe that if the architect, architect, architecture is right, you have a shot, even though this is very disruptive. But uh, you know, I think that the question that Eric asked me earlier is like, VMware helped a lot to make the last round work. This round, we're relying on mobile. Facebook really hasn't honed in on the mobile experience. There really a question there. Can I just go ahead? Yeah. Uh, are you planning to support multiple platforms? Yes. Right now it's on the iPhone. No, like I meant Android and also Mac, PC, oh. web. Um, eventually. But we are very careful about rolling them out, rolling out to the platforms. So, um, you know, because it just uh, multiplies your engineering costs when you go across platforms. But we, we definitely, we, we will eventually. This is a matter of time. There's a question? One, uh, one last question. Mm -hmm. This actually goes back to the first company. Um, you would you know that changing behavior is difficult. And I, yeah, definitely. Um, you were kind of the little startup, as you said, going after the giant customer. Yeah. Do you have any insights or tips about how you can attempt to change behavior? Sure, I'm not sure. Huh? Jedi mind tricks. Sorry? Jedi mind tricks. Jedi. Jedi mind tricks. Jedi mind tricks that VMware played on people. In that particular case, I think VMware was, uh, was the catalyst, seriously, because uh, they, everybody listens to them. And so they first got the mindset that desktop virtualization is useful, and then they all put money in, they tried it, and then, and then we just say, we are, the super, you know, we are doing it the right way. So that's what it, we did in the first company. Um, it is very hard. Um, uh, um, let's put it this way, even for the first company, I tried very hard not to go the enterprise way, but we have no choice. And this second company, it's a, this is a totally consumer company, consumer pro um, product company, and, uh, and you to play totally different games. And it's actually a lot easier because you don't have this long lead time. You know, the, the first, so one of the, yeah, I mean, there are companies we have talked to for like five years before we finally, we finally have the right product, they iterate with us, and then they finally bought, you know, it is a long, long haul. I don't think there is any, any magic uh, bullet for that. So, maybe I'll take one more. <laughs> we'll talk later, afterwards. Yeah, uh, uh, the, for the VMware, the penalty will be quite expensive because they have paid different kind of licenses for the OS. Now, do you have the same problem? It's not the license. The OS is a, but not by now, uh, Microsoft has made, has, has made it really cheap. What is expensive uh, for VMware is that, uh, first of all, you still have to have a thin client, and the thin client is as expensive as a PC. And then you have to manage the thing. But most importantly, all the costs of the data center are extra. All right? It's like, now I have a part of a data center processor that I'm using for my desktop. And, yeah, and servers are expensive. It sits in these 
data centers, now you have to have the operations, you have to have the energy costs. And by the way, how many how many bytes, how many, how much disk space do you have? Okay. Take everybody's disk space, put it in the data center and have them spin continuously. Alright, now calculate the overhead. And then on top of that they discover is like, whoa, at nine o'clock everybody logs in. And now you have this this they call this the boot storm, right? It is the boot up storm. And it just it just goes on and on and on when you when you take all these um, cycles that everybody has already paid for and it's like, wait now I turn it into a huge installation. It's like it's that's one of the cost is. I mean we are like um, I, I, you know, it is just, it is not the license. It is the hardware and the operating cost of the data center. And they, and they are, that's very expensive. And then on top of it, it is really bad user experience. <laughs> so it just doesn't work. So, thank you very much, Professor Lan. And uh, thanks for all this insight and all this. Thank you very much.